Well, good morning, and welcome to the Sunday after Easter. <clears throat> as, as you think about the story uh, that, that we've talked about around Jesus and his life, after the resurrection is when it all starts to get really exciting. I, I don't know if you, you spent time thinking about the, the Easter weekend from Friday to Sunday, and, but I'm sure that that was an incredibly emotionally draining and, and contemplative moment. And, and I, I, I can't imagine that anybody went through that uh, without it exhausting them. And, and we practice that ritual even today. I know that, that having been in a pastor's family, Easter, much like Christmas, is an exhausting period of time in the life of the church. And so on East, uh, the Sunday after Easter, a lot of times we see that the pastors that have pastoral staff will have associates and different things preach because they're just wiped out after all the events from, from through Lent and Easter. Well, <clears throat> but that's when the story itself starts to get really exciting. If you have been in that moment, from the moment Jesus was crucified and laid in that tomb through Saturday, and then news of his resurrection starts hitting the ground on Sunday. Well, from that moment, the story changes. Now, I've told you before that the real part of the story, the gift in all of it, comes on Friday. That's the provision for the forgiveness of our sins. But the story itself starts getting exciting when you start talking about resurrection. <clears throat> Everything in the whole world literally changed as the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ began to circulate. Now, I already told you about the gift of Friday, but that resurrection is phenomenal just on its own merits. It's a big story. Can you see the headlines if they had newspapers in Jerusalem at that point? Man comes back to life after three days dead. And that was, that's a huge headline, and that would even be a huge headline today, wouldn't it? Because we don't hear stories like that about someone coming back to life. Even with all the medical advances that we have, we've, we've heard of doctors bringing folks back to life after some moments of flatline and things of that nature. But we don't hear of somebody that's been dead for three or four days and being brought back to life. This is a huge story, and it impacts everything about the world in which we live. So... The story of Jesus coming back to life, it's the real deal. And now, in the, in the storyline, on Sunday and Monday, Jesus is starting to reveal himself to people. To give folks evidence that this story is true. And this is a major, major miracle. Now, we're going to pick up the story in the tail end of John's Gospel. So, so here's the deal. Everything John wrote in his gospel was so that, his words, you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and John tells us all this in this passage, in, in these close to the final words of the gospel. Before he does that, he wraps up a few more details about Jesus' resurrection, giving one more set of details to give us more impetus to believe in Jesus. Now, let me share this passage from the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the 19th verse. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord Jesus. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Won't you pray with me? Lord, may the words that come out of my mouth and the things that all of us are thinking about in these next few moments put a smile on your face. May they be pleasing to you, the one who is our strength and our redeemer. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your son, Jesus, and all God's children said. Amen. Well, in looking at this passage, I was struggling to try to figure out what it was I was supposed to say. And as is my common practice, when all else fails with my creative juices for sermonizing, I said, well, let's just walk through the passage. So that's what I want to do today. So, so this passage starts with the disciples locked in a room. This is how you, how you evangelize and reach people. This is actually the model that most churches are using today to reach new people, is they're locking themselves in their church and, and protecting themselves and, and taking care of business. But the, the disciples, for legitimate fear, because they were not sure what the Jewish leaders were going to do, they were locked in a room thinking about all this, praying, talking, and trying to figure out what in the world is going on. In the midst of that, in the locked room with no entrance, Jesus appears. <clears throat> now that's some of the information that people will use to try to explain, well, or define the new body that we have upon resurrection. I don't understand all that. I'm not a, I'm not a biologist or a botanist or any of those kind of things. But, but I, I do understand that God tells us through the word that we will have a new body, <laughs> a perfected body. And I'm looking forward to that. But, so... In the midst of this, in a locked room, Jesus appears to them. And he starts their conversation with these words. Peace be with you. Now as I heard that, I always kind of think about, uh, have you ever noticed that every time one of the Lord's angels appears to humans, the almost inevitably the first words out of their mouths are, don't be afraid. Now I have this opinion I don't know that this is fact because I've never seen an angel for myself, but I have this idea that an angel, if we actually see one, is an impressive, shall we say, vision. So much so that every time they appear, they have to think, it's okay, calm down. And I kind of had that idea with this moment. As Jesus appears to the disciples, I, we don't really know. We do know that he looked different because the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus walked with him for miles and didn't recognize him. So we don't understand all this, but whatever it is, Jesus starts the conversation with peace be with you. And I'm reminded of another place in the Gospels where Jesus said, peace, I leave with you. And so this, this notion of peace is where they start. And, and obviously, the disciples were, were either suspicious or confused. Because almost immediately Jesus starts showing them his hands and his side to help them understand who it, who it is. And he did that simply so that they would believe. That they would believe it was him. And according to the way John records it, 
very quickly their suspicions and confusion just melted away and it turns to joy john recorded that the the disciples were overjoyed at seeing jesus and i can imagine that was true don't you think they had seen him crucified they'd been here in this scuttlebutt that that he had been resurrected that he was alive and now they get to see it for themselves. Well, John records that, that Jesus then tells them that he's sending them out just like God had sent him. But before he sends them, he gives them the Holy Spirit. And this is the critical piece of the puzzle that so many of us forget. That, that when we are sent out, that God sends all of us out. Once we come into relationship with him, God sends us out. Not to stay in the locked room, but to go out into the world and share the gospel. But before he does that, he breathes on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and did you catch that? Exactly how Jesus gives the Holy Spirit? John records that he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. As we're in the kind of the final phases of the scripture, I'm reminded in that passage all the way back to the beginning, back to the second chapter of Genesis, where it talks about that God formed man, and then he breathed the breath of life in him. And in this moment, Jesus then breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit, the one that sustains life, that helps lead and guide us through this life to help us do what it is we're supposed to do. That's the exact same way. And, and now that Jesus has breathed this life on us, real life on us, and into creation through the Holy Spirit. And this is the only way that we can live a life that pleases God. We can try all kinds of things, but until we find ourselves in alignment with the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit is the one that has the information to help guide us to do the right things, to do the right things the right way. And so we need this Holy Spirit. So many times, I've watched this in years and years and years, and we see every time, it seems like, when some very well-known rock star or, or uh, actor or actress or especially athlete has a salvation experience, have you ever noticed that almost immediately the church sends them out to go tell people about Jesus? And there are a few stories that have worked out well, but most of them have gotten complicated. And it's because we need to have time to get the connection with the Holy Spirit, to get ourselves in line with God's will. And so we need that relationship with the Holy Spirit to be able to do out do what it is that God calls us to do. Once Jesus has imparted this Holy Spirit to them, Jesus sends them out with this statement. Again, receive the Holy Spirit. Accept, acknowledge, yield to the Holy Spirit. Then he says this, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And then he says this, if you do not forgive anyone's sins, they are not forgiven. That seems to put a lot of power in the disciples' hands, doesn't it? But there's, there's something going on there, and I believe, again, it has to do with that connection to the Holy Spirit, to know what it is we are supposed to and not supposed to do. But in that moment, Jesus has told them that they have the power to forgive sins, and they have the power to not forgive sins. There's some power in this as he dispatches them to forgive sins. They are to become bearers of the grace of God. And Jesus is still sending us out to do the exact same thing today. When we are received in by the grace of God, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on us. Then he instructs us to receive the Holy Spirit and go out. Offering forgiveness of sins so that other people might also believe. Wow. 
What an honor that God allows us to be a part of the story. This is something that only God can do, right? But God invites us to be emissaries of that grace and gives us, in some theological sense, it's an illusion to think that we have any part of forgiving sins or not forgiving sins. But, but God, Jesus tells them that you are included in the process. And I think that's to put some weight on it so that we take it seriously. We need to be engaged in this process. We need to be doing things and helping people come to the point of believing for themselves. Well, in the midst of all this story, <laughs> we have this Thomas thing. Our favorite doubter, right? For years and years and years throughout the church, we, we've, we've used Thomas. He's been our scapegoat. There's always people that doubt. And, and let's be honest. If, if we're really honest with ourselves and, and with God, a lot of us would probably tend to align with Thomas. If, especially if we had been there. If you had been standing there in the crowd and watching what happened to Jesus. And you'd seen him breathe his last. And then somebody comes and tells you, Jesus is alive. And the only image you have is that image of Jesus' limp body hanging on the cross. I don't know if you would be willing to raise your hand, but I bet there's a lot of us that would probably be in that same camp with Thomas. We would have a difficult time believing that Jesus had been resurrected. We don't struggle with it as much now because we have the history of all this and we, we see all the pieces. We see it more clearly because we have more information, right? But in that moment, I think probably a lot more of us would have been aligned with Thomas. Skeptical of this most unusual of circumstances. <clears throat> Even if this were to happen today, most of us would be skeptical. I think, I think of those familiar grade school playground words <laughs> when somebody makes some wild claim. Remember this? Proved it. That's where Thomas was. I, I think in his heart he wanted to believe, but he just had a proof it bug in him. So, as Jesus appears again in this moment, <laughs> Jesus proves it. He offers his hands in his side and tells Thomas to see and feel for himself. And Thomas does. And immediately, Thomas' countenance changes. My Lord and my God. I love what Jesus says to Thomas next. And I think these are words that we need to, we probably ought to have them etched on the walls of churches all over the place. Because Jesus told him this, because you have seen me, <laughs> you believed. Because you felt me, you saw, you touched, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Some might argue that it's very easy to believe something once you've verified it. Who was it that said trust but verify? My dad used to say it this way. He says, walk. Trust no living person and walk carefully among the dead. Thomas verified that this was Jesus, making it much easier for him to believe. To believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. From this point forward, believing would not be an act of knowing and verifying. From this point forward, believing would be an act of faith. Faith is where we, we believe things we haven't seen and we trust that it's true. Maybe some of you have, have done a trust fall. I know this has been a popular part of youth ministry for years and years and years. And I see a lot of, anytime they're doing uh, group building initiatives, 
trust falls are often one of the things. And, and the extreme version of it is, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain something so that those that have never seen this. The extreme version of it is there's a platform. And you have one person stand up on that platform. And again, the extreme version of it is you blindfold them. And then you turn them backwards and stand them on the edge of the platform. What they don't know is that you have then gathered the rest of the group together to form a safety net for them with their arms. And then you encourage the person to fall backwards. And you say, trust me that you'll be okay. That's what Jesus is inviting us to do now. To trust and just fall into his arms. Believing is much easier when you can verify it for yourself. But now we are invited to believe. To believe it based on these words written thousands and thousands of years ago. And on the experiences of all those who have lived between then and now. Well, when you break all this down, the entirety of the Bible is a hopeful, expected collection of writings, all with one goal, that you might believe. From creation to Exodus to King Solomon to Ruth to Isaiah to John the Baptizer to Jesus to Peter to Paul, right up to you and me right now. This is all so that you might believe. Listen again to what John wrote in verses 30 and 31, concluding this chapter. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So I have to ask you this question. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? That Jesus is the Son of God? The promised Messiah? The Deliverer? Salvation for us all? Do you believe he died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice so that your sins might be forgiven? Maybe this is the first time you've heard this in a way that makes sense to you. Maybe you've, you have some questions. I want to invite you to ask those questions and do whatever it takes so that you can find ways to say publicly that you believe. Don't put it off any longer. All of this, the whole Bible, everything we do in the church is all for the simple reason. And that's this. So that you might believe in Jesus. Won't you pray with me? God, I'm reminded of the scripture passage where the, the person is invited to believe by Jesus. And they respond, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, at this moment, help us to surrender ourselves to you. Help us to acknowledge that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, salvation for us all. Lord, I pray for anyone who's in this room this morning that that doesn't know that saving grace that you offer. Drive it home to them this morning, Lord. Or light a fire under them that burns so hot that they can't sit down until they ask the questions to get the information they need so that they too can believe. Lord, then give us all the strength to step out into the world that you've created. A world that so desperately needs to know your grace and love. A world that continuously wanders away from your will. And offer the love and grace that you have poured out on this world.
Help us believe, Lord, so that we can help others believe. We pray these things in the strong and precious name of your son, Jesus, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.